House of Mystery presents Inside Writing, the radio show where authors discuss their writing process in all genres. Welcome back into the House of Mystery, and I'm Al Warren, and we got Mr. David Caca Martino. <laughs> I should have told you that, Al. I you know. shouldn't have. No. No. That's, yeah. Now that was my. Got... That was my my first word. That's your first word. First and word. You, yeah. And you still still yeah. sound the same. It's, it's all the same. Uh, <laughs> it hasn't changed. It hasn't changed. Now, see, now now you're an important. So remember that, mothers. If your baby's first <laughs> word is "caca," they're going to be a radio guy. Yeah, right. <laughs> just, just remember that they'll be like Howard Stern. Yeah, you don't want that. No, no. It's the worst, worst <laughs> thing you could ever ask for. You know, <laughs> you know they'll be wearing white after Labor Day. Hmm. I don't know. It's terrible. Can, why can't you wear white after Labor Day? I don't know. Well, you're the one that comes up with the rules. I am. Oh yes. <laughs> you're, you're just, no, it just, it just, it just doesn't look good. You know. You don't want to. You don't want to blend in with the snow. Oh yeah, but in California yeah. or Florida, you never worry yeah, about that. So well, that's can, true. <laughs> you could wear white all year. Yeah. You know. Anyway, yeah. I don't, so, does that even exist anymore? Do those rules? I heard that the other day. Someone said you you can't wear white after oh, Labor Day. It's still, it's still there. Yeah. So does somebody still believes it? <laughs> <laughs> anyway, well, now today. Um, we're going to get uh, into uh, a little more serious uh, of what we've been this last week, but uh, a kind of a family domestic abuse, the whole situation going on here. So uh, we have a survivor, and uh, she has written a book. Now, the book is called Stronger Than That. It's a domestic violence survivor uncovers the truth about her abuser. So welcome, Sarah Doucette. Thanks for being here. Oh, thanks for having me. Sarah, now it sounds like you've had quite the uh, the uh, life um, to go through in order to write this kind of memoir. Um, where do you want to start here? Do you want to start before you met this guy and kind of tell us a little bit about your younger life and how, how was that? Sure. So I grew up in a pretty small town in southern Maine. So if uh, you're not familiar with Maine, I am down on the coast. So I grew up on the water, um, rocky shores, eating lobster, um, all the quintessential Mainer or maniacs, as some people call us, um, things. Uh, I was about 30 minutes from Portland, which is kind of now the nowadays, it's like the food mecca of um, kind of New England. But, you know, it was a lot smaller, obviously, back back when I was younger and hanging around town with my friends. Um, and I had kind of the, a very traditional upbringing. Um, you know, my parents, uh, mom stayed home, dad went to work. And, you know, we did all the little family vacation things every year. Um, but my parents were extremely religious. Um, so I had like a very sheltered um, early life, I would say. So when I graduated high school, I ended up going to Florida, which is, was as far as I could think of from Maine, um, and opposite of Maine, right? Sunshine, snow, didn't, didn't want any more of the snow for a little while. Um, and that's where I ended up uh, meeting my ex-husband when I was down in Florida. Now, when you say when you when you were growing up, but um, you said your parents were pretty strict uh, and uh, and religions, and um, so you had kind of a sheltered life in a sense because you were living by the book, so to speak. Mm -hmm. um, so when you had that kind of a lifestyle, um, looking back at it now, do you think that that had anything to do with the with finding who you did as a partner or setting you up for finding who this guy was? Like, do you think it has any relation to it? I think I was ill prepared for his personality type. Um, I went to church all the time. I went to a Christian school. 
all of my activities were centered around church and the people in church. So, you know, I had a very small circle. And then when I left Maine and I went to Florida, my world just kind of expanded and I had never witnessed. I had never heard of anyone who had been in an abusive relationship. I only had one boyfriend before going to college and I just was very ill prepared to deal with an adult relationship. And I think in that sense, it definitely um, contributed to me not knowing how to navigate the situations that I was in down there. Yeah. That's kind of sort of what I meant in a sense that um, in a way that you're so protected, you're not aware of certain things really being of real life. And all of a sudden you come across it. It's, it's, you don't know how to deal with it. Right. right? You don't have the experience. Um, so at, let's let's talk about that meeting. So when you met him, mm-hmm. um, how was it? It was great. Um, we kind of met by chance. I wasn't supposed to be hanging out with him. Just a friend called and said, hey, you want to meet for dinner? And I was like, no, I, I just ate. And he was with another one of his friends, which ended up being um, my soon-to-be husband back then. And my ex-husband got on the phone with me and was just so charismatic and just had such a big personality. And he, you know, convinced me like, come on, let's go, just come out. You can have an appetizer or a drink, but come out with us. And so against what I wanted to do, he convinced me. And so I went to dinner with um, my friend and he introduced me to, um, yeah, my now ex-husband. And we had such a great time hanging out. I was so shy and introverted again, coming from, you know, such a sheltered background, um, making friends was difficult for me. So when I met him, he had this huge network of people because he was that personality that everyone wanted to hang out with. And I was so excited to be kind of swept up into that and have like this instant peer group when I was down in a state where I really didn't know anyone and I had no network myself. Um, so it was a lot of fun, you know, for that first year hanging out with him and, you know, being part of the world of Steven. Were there any red flags early on with him or was this something that you just wouldn't have noticed at the time? There were a couple of red flags, but I am... I'm a very forgiving person. I'm trying to think of the best way to describe it. I find myself and I work on this um, in my own like journey towards, you know, mental health and creating healthy boundaries till this day. But I'm the type of person that you could do something wrong against me and I create an excuse for you. Oh, they did this because. And so with that type of personality, especially back then before I had really any intimate experience with a, a an extreme narcissist, you know, really someone with an antisocial personality disorder, if you you want to get real direct about it, Um, you know, all the little red flags that if I saw them now, I would turn and run the other way. I just came up with an excuse for like, while we were dating, um, he got mad at me for some reason, and he just kind of shut down and I could just feel the energy. And I remember asking him while we were in the car, are you mad at me right now? And he just turned and looked at me and said, you wouldn't want to see me when I'm angry. So just leave me alone. And I was like, Oh, how sweet of him to protect me from his anger. He's just trying to like calm himself down. <laughs> of course, like, you know, at uh, 19 years old, right. What do I, what did I know about that? Um, looking at it now, I'm like, that's, that's not sweet at all. <laughs> now. Okay. So you, you're, you're doing this and you're, you've met this guy and you're kind of cruising along how were your parents now? Because they're, they're the strict religious uh, couple. What were they doing and saying to you um, about this guy? So they really only met him twice before we um, got engaged and got married. Because I was in Florida in college. They were up here in Maine. Um, we had some hurricanes come through. I was down there in, in college during the, the four big hurricanes um, that went through Florida um, back in, what was it, 2004, 2005, and they shut down my college campus. And so my parents were like, well, come home and visit. And I asked if I could bring a friend. And so I brought him with me. And at this point, we were dating. We weren't an official couple. And, you know, for a couple of days up here with my parents, he, of course, like charmed the pants off of them. And, you know, they liked him. 
And so then, you know, we dated for a year and on our one year anniversary is when he proposed. Um, so I was 20, I think when we ended up getting engaged, my mom had come down and met him one other time. Um, and I think she had some reservations, but, you know, couldn't put her finger on it either. Um, and so, you know, she had a conversation with me, just, are you sure? I said, yes, you know, I was a smitten kitten. I was so in love. And I think probably against their better judgment, they were like, well, we don't really know him well, and we trust you to make good decisions. But they were just as inexperienced as I was because they had never known me to date anyone. So we were all kind of in brand new territory with, you know, me dating and bringing a, a boy home and let alone getting engaged and getting married at 20. <laughs> Okay, so so this comes along. Was there anything, did you have um, any reservations about marrying him at all? I didn't. Um, the only thing that I remember right before we got married is there was a big argument with his parents because he and I had wanted to move in together um, the month before our wedding. And we had rented an apartment and his parents, who also were very religious, um, were absolutely against it and our wedding gift from them was going to be our living room furniture and they refused to give us the furniture until um after we were married because they didn't want us living together so i ended up living in the apartment by myself for a month and he stayed over at his um, parents house and it just struck me as odd the way that i never argued with my parents okay so you know, when my parents said something like my brother and I were like, yes, ma'am. Yes, sir. You know, and we did it. And it was just very interesting to me to see him, you know, kind of going head to head yelling match with his dad. Um, but again, I, I, you know, red flag maybe, but people argue with their parents all the time. So I kind of talked my way out of it and just kept right on going. Okay. Well, you know, yeah, you can't, you know, people, people handle their family different than they do sometimes, especially a dad. Um, so what, what, so what, happened you get married and uh did you move somewhere um or what, what what set up your marriage now so we got married in january um so and we came up here in maine um so we could be around my family and my ex worked for a music store like a big retail chain and i had told him that when i got married and i had kids i wanted to raise my family in maine and his family was from Connecticut originally, so he was fine with, you know, heading back north. So right after we got married, uh, the company he worked for was opening a location in Maine. And so he applied and was selected to go help open up that new store as uh, an assistant manager. So we got married in January. By February, we moved up to Maine and we stayed in Maine for a few months. And then he got promoted to running his own store and we ended up moving down to the Boston area of Massachusetts uh, for him to do that. And we were in Massachusetts for probably about a year and a half, maybe. Um, eventually he got in trouble at work and we moved back down to Florida. And that's where we spent the last four years of our marriage was back down in Florida. So when you say he got in trouble, did he get fired? Or? He did not get fired. What ended up happening, and I, I have no idea if this is the real story. Um, he told a lot of lies, if you can imagine. And he did not file new hire paperwork for an employee. And so they ended up demoting him from management. And I think that he had ended up lying about what happened. Like he probably would have had a slap on the wrist, but he lied and blamed it on another one of his employees saying, well, I tried to trust my employee to do that. So it was a whole thing. And they ended up demoting him back to sales and out of management. And that was humiliating for him up here. So he ended up reaching out to the people back down in Florida. They took him back and very quickly put him back in management once we got back down there. Now, when you went back to Florida, did, did he change then? Is that When was the first time you noticed any sort of a a change with him towards you? It was immediate. Um, we actually um, had the worst honeymoon. Um, he he changed as soon as we left for the airport the next morning after our wedding. Um, there's 
uh, I, I, I kind of lay out this whole story about just how horrible traveling with him was. He was horrible and rude to the airline staff. You know, he was that guy that people are like nowadays are, are filming from the background, just being belligerent with the flight attendants and with the, um, the gate check people. He was trying to demand an upgrade to first class because we were on our honeymoon and he just thought he was entitled to all of these things. And then he got really upset when he realized that he wasn't going to be getting any special treatment because he was on his honeymoon. Like a lot of people were going to this, the Dominican Republic is where we went for our honeymoon. Like a lot of people were going to resorts for their honeymoon. So he, for some reason thought he was special. And when I tried to kind of calm him down and bring him under control, um, it was the first time that he had ever, you know, kind of just like grabbed me by the arm and just told me exactly what he expected from me as far as like, do not, do not ever correct me or speak to me like that. And I was like, whoa, whoa, whoa. Okay. (laughs) Um, Yeah. So it changed pretty quickly. I actually ended up um, leaving within the first year. So um, some quick stats on um, domestic violence and domestic abuse, um, it takes an average of seven times uh, for a victim to leave and stay gone. And so I left him a couple of times. And the first time I left was um, actually most of the times I left was in that first year. So I left him once I came, but I just drove from Massachusetts to Maine. Um, He took a few days of just like calling me and texting me just, being completely vile. And then finally he drove up here and we had a whole heart to heart conversation. And, you know, he convinced me to go back. He apologized and said, you know, yes, I'm doing things wrong. However, you do this, that leads me to do this. And me being the person that I am who creates excuses for people, I a hundred percent bought in to what he was saying that, you know what, you're right takes two to tango. I obviously have things to fix too. Like, let's work on this together. Um, And this, ladies and gentlemen, is what we like to call gaslighting, where they do something wrong and they end up turning it around and tell you that you've done something wrong. (laughs) Right, right. But quite often you don't recognize that. No, when you're in it, you don't recognize it. When is it that you start to decide that you do want to leave? Like, what, what, what was the incident? So the first incident that made me want to leave is, and this is a story that I, I tell in the book, but there was a moment where I don't even know what set him off, um, but he was very upset as he was leaving for work one day. And I asked him, what time do you think you'll be home tonight? Because it always varied, and he expected the house clean and dinner on the table when he came home, right? So I would go to work all day, get home before him, clean and have dinner ready. And for some reason, that question set him off that day. And so he started throwing things at me while I was still in bed. And then he just decided to pick up dirty socks and dirty underwear and dirty clothes and just throw them at me. And by the time he was done screaming and yelling at me, I was basically like laying in bed buried in all of his dirty socks and underwear. And he said that he couldn't even stand to look at me, that he just hated me, couldn't even stand to look at me. And at that moment, I was just like, okay, well, I guess this is over. And so I I ended up just not going to work. I just got in my car and drove home. And so that was the first time that I ended up leaving. After I came back, it was within a couple of months that I, I left again. You know, it just, he was good for probably a couple of weeks. And then he just started, you know, backsliding back into that, you know, talking to me like that and just being not so physical at that moment, but more, you know, just his words and, you know, just tearing, tearing down my self-esteem and and just saying, you know, horrible things about me to me. And so I left for the second time. Um, Again, he came up and apologized and, you know, we talked about going into counseling. We we talked about all these different things and I ended up going back again. And then sh- very shortly after that is when the stuff went down at his work and he got transferred back down to Florida. And in my head, I'm like, okay, we were happy in Florida. Like none of our problems started until after we got married and we moved up North. So in an effort to save my marriage and get back to that happy place, I was like, yes, let's go to Florida. And it did. It worked. We were, we were doing a lot better. I mean, there were definitely still some ups and downs, but I would say we probably had a good like six months of, you know, it was tolerable. 
uh, for me. But then after that, it's, it's, it's so hard to describe unless, you know, you've, you've kind of been in there, but they very slowly eat away at your self-esteem and your self-respect. And, you know, I just had no respect for myself. I didn't think I was worth getting out of this situation. And then also growing up super religious, right? Like divorce was not a thing that was heard of. And if it was the people who got divorced were like ostracized from the church, it was such a dirty word that I was like, I've made my bed. I have to lie in it. I'm, I'm just going to have to figure this out. Did, uh, did things continue to escalate? Did they escalate from like verbal to physical? Is that uh, what happened? Yeah. And a lot of it was really subtle. Um, even right up until the end, I always told people like, well, he never laid a hand on me until that last night. Part of what we talk about in this book is how I just kind of disassociated with some of the things that he was doing. And I didn't even recognize or remember that it happened until I started writing the book. And so one of the things that he used to do a lot was if I would toss and turn in bed, it would bother him. Or if I accidentally touched him while, you know, if I was sleeping on on a leg or an arm drifted to his side, he would roll over and either punch or kick me on my sides. And so I would wake up in the morning and I have bruises on my side or on my hips. And, you know, in my head, I just remember thinking like, oh, he just wakes up so cranky. <laughs> and I look back at that now and I'm like, people don't wake up like that cranky. <laughs> well, <laughs> <laughs> no, but you know, um, in essence, it's just one of those things that you kind of, uh, you know, you, you get married, everything looks great. And then it just starts getting really, um, emotionally abusive and then leads right into the into physical and that so what is what do you think um is the hardest thing about trying to leave and um and why do not not a lot of people do it and you say that it takes seven average of seven times so maybe explain that to listeners that that aren't living in this sort of situation they don't understand it and they just go well why didn't you just leave them you know, that sort of thing. What, 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 what's the, what's the, the down low on this? Sure. It's super complex. There's a lot of different reasons and everyone's reason is, is different. But first of all, for women that are in a violent relationship, specifically women, I mean, there are different statistics for men. Um, but for women that are in these relationships, the two weeks after you leave, it's probably the most dangerous time of your life. When your abuser loses the control over you. Um, This is when most homicides happen. Um, I actually have um, a cousin and her sister-in-law in that two week period was um, murdered by her husband um, when leaving. It's just very dangerous when these guys lose control. And so if you know that having an argument with your husband, instead of like normal people who are like, go sleep on the couch, you know, you're in the doghouse now, um, you don't have that option. Like you could, you could actually like end up hurt or dead. Like if you're not a hundred percent sure that your husband won't kill you, sometimes you can't just walk out the door. The other thing is, you know, for me personally, like I, I just remember having these conversations in my own head about failing at marriage, disappointing my family, disappointing his family. Like there's just a whole lot of social pressure on you as well. You know, nobody wants to be a failure. And when you're in these relationships, it's never, it's never the other person's fault, right? Like they've convinced you that you're causing their behavior a lot of the times. So that can be another, you know, part of it. And that can also be a part of why, you know, people have said to me, like, I wish you had reached out to me. I would have helped you. There's just a lot of shame and stereotypes still around being a victim of domestic abuse and domestic violence. And so it it can be difficult to be that vulnerable and admit that someone is mistreating you. Um, So I think that's another layer on top of it. And then one of the things that happened to me um, and actually happens a lot more um, than we think is uh, financial and economic abuse. So when you're in these types of situations, 90% of the time, the abuser is in control of all of the bank accounts, all of the finances. You don't have the money to leave. For me, I, I just, I just, I, I, I had enough. And he, you know, he assaulted me. He slammed me up against the wall. Like he was throwing things at me. It was a couple of hours of just 
torture from him. And then he finally passed out because he had been drinking. And when I heard him snoring in the other room, I just grabbed what few things I could and got in my little two door car. And I lived in that car. I didn't have kids. I did have two, two pets that I loved dearly, but I had to leave them behind. Um, and I was living in the parking lot of work for a couple of weeks until I could figure out the money situation um, because he kept cleaning out the bank accounts after I left. So if you have children, like living in your car is not always an option. And sometimes, you know, I know I personally had no idea that there were resources out there for me. Um, so there's another thing that's uh, part of financial and economic abuse, and it's called coercive debt. And that was a big thing for me. Um, my ex-husband had actually used my social and financed tens of thousands of dollars in things. He opened credit cards. He bought big fancy computers and then never paid for any of them. And the first time he did that to me was actually in our first month of marriage. He told me that as a new manager, they gave him this laptop, but they didn't. He went on Dell, used my social, financed it, never made a payment. So when I ended up leaving him six years later, there were six years of bad debt. My credit was in the toilet. Um, I had creditors reaching out to me after, because after I found out about this stuff, I started reaching out. I needed all the info for my divorce proceedings. And so I updated my info with these people and I, I was chased by creditors for years. It can be really, really complicated to untangle yourself financially. And a lot of times these men won't allow women to work. Um, if you look on the um, the National Association for Domestic Violence website, right on their front page, there's this huge article about how many millions of dollars are lost to the economy each year because people who are in these types of relationships, um, either they don't go to work because they have visible bruising. So they, you know, companies are paying out sick time and not getting employees working. Um, a lot of times these guys will harass you at work and to the point where your employer is finally like, okay, I have to let you go. We can't deal with this. Um, or, you know, the husband just doesn't allow them to get a job. No, you're going to stay at home and raise my kids while I go do whatever it is that I want. So it's not always super easy to go because you don't have access to money and you don't have a way of earning money. Well, you mentioned uh, not knowing about the resources that were out there. What type of resources are available for people in, in this situation? In Maine specifically, um, I've been on the board of directors for a domestic violence advocacy group, and it was amazing to me how much is available if you know where to look. Um, if you just go on the national page, they can get you connected with local resources. But we did things like, you know, you could show up on our doorstep at any time of the day or night. And we always had um, hotels with local hotels, uh, hotel rooms with local hotels available. So we could immediately in an emergency put you up in a hotel that night and it was paid for by the organization. Um, there were grants out there that would do this. We also would have housing where people could live for a few months with them and their kids until they got that job. And we had resources and advocates that would help you fill out job applications. I personally have sat down with women who haven't touched their checking account in years and didn't know how to balance their checkbook or make a budget um, and kind of teach them how to do that kind of stuff. Um, up here in Maine, there are legal services that you can get for free to help you get through the divorce process, to help you work on custody if you do have kids in this type of situation. Um, and then, of course, you know, they can help connect you with mental health uh, services and counseling. Because a lot of these women, including myself back when I first left, they're dealing with major self-esteem issues and suicidal thoughts and tendencies. You know, it's a very emotional time. So there is just a ton of resources out there um, for people if um, if you know where to look. And the best place to start is just to call the national hotline, and then they can get you connected with local resources where you are. Now, after after you left them, you were living in your car and all that stuff. Um, how did did he still try to get you to come back, and did he still come after you? So he did not. Um, what ended up happening was he was actually having an affair at the time that I left, and he didn't think that I knew about it, but I did. We had talked about getting divorced, so I knew that he 
had started focusing on someone else. And I harbor a little bit of guilt of being like, great, she can have him. I'm just going to worry about my own self and get the heck out of here. Um, but I think at the time I felt like it was a blessing that he was, he preferred somebody else over me. Um, no, he was all over me because he just wanted to fight about all of the things. I left everything. I was like, I want my clothes. I ended up going back and taking the cats one night when he was not there. Um, but that was the biggest thing. And <laughs> there's an incident that I um, talk about in our, in my book about um, when he realized that I had moved my money into my own bank account. So my direct deposit didn't go into our account and he immediately calls me and wants, demands to know where my money is. I tell him I have my own account. And he was just like, well, how am I supposed to eat? And I just remember it was like the first moment I kind of found my voice against him. And I was like, I don't know, maybe go return the $200 you spent at the mall last night. Because he, every time my account, my check got deposited, he was emptying the accounts before I could get to the money, which is why I ended up living in my car for so long. Yeah, it was just stupid stuff like that. Um, but I ended up keeping my location hidden from him. I changed, you know, my contact information. When I filled out my divorce papers, um, I was down in Florida and my cousin was a deputy on the sheriff's department on the SWAT team. So I used his address. So I was like, go ahead and show up at my cousin's house, see what happens. <laughs> um, you know, so I, I just did whatever instinctually my my body and my mind told me to do to keep myself safe. Um, the building I worked in, I worked in insurance at the time. We had armed security at the doors, so he couldn't get in there to me. So I felt pretty safe. And then once I had changed all my contact information, um, you know, he just, he didn't know where, he didn't know where to find me. So whatever happened, how did this end up then? Like, so you, uh, you obviously got away and did he uh, move on and marry that, that new girl? So interesting. Um, if you, re- if you read the book, I actually reached out to her and interviewed her for, for the purpose of this book. Um, and she and I found that, you know, we actually got along really well. and We connected on social media. She's a very, you know, nice girl. And he stopped wearing his wedding ring to work. So first of all, um, she didn't realize that he was married in, in the beginning of their flirtations. She quickly realized, though, a lot faster than I did, that there were some major red flags. And he would drive by her house. He was kind of stalking her. And so she recognized that stuff and and ended it. Um, So luckily, she did not get, you know, fully sucked in to the Stephen show. After we got divorced and I moved back to Maine, it was just over two years um, from our divorce when I received a phone call from his mother, I just remember thinking it was super weird. It was like nine or like seven o'clock at night. She didn't usually call me that late at night. Um, so I called her back after I saw I missed the call. And she told me that Steven's body had been found in the woods and it was either homicide or suicide and that the police were investigating. So that was pretty shocking. Um, And I remember, you know, there was a conversation I had with my mother that I I detail in the book, how we both sat there for a moment. We're just like, he loved himself so much. I couldn't see that he would end his life by suicide. Um, But I was like, I definitely could see him upsetting someone to the point where they might kill him. So in my head, I was leaning towards homicide. And I was just shocked when it came out that he had ended his life by suicide. Um. No, I I didn't know why or what had happened. His family has lied to me the whole time about all the circumstances surrounding it. And shortly after his his funeral, um, I I basically just like kind of cut myself off from them as well. Um, Staying in contact with them was very toxic. Um, After leaving, I I again, red flags about his about his family that I ignored, I started seeing. So I kind of cut myself off from that. But through doing a little bit of investigation and um, reading an article that someone had written and posted about my ex-husband, I found that he had gone into business with someone. Um, It was a a doctor starting a new medical practice and he hired my ex-husband to be his business manager. If we remember back to where I was saying that my ex-husband used my identity to finance things, uh, he ended up doing the same thing to this doctor. And I believe the charges were felony grand larceny of over 150,000. It ended up being around $250,000 that he, um, between cash, credit card, 
he somehow managed to get into this this doctor's bank and into his security his safety deposit box. He got the bank to let him in and he took physical gold and silver and sold it. And so he ended up getting caught and he was arrested and he was looking at charges of up to 15 years per charge. So a possible max of 30 years in prison if they, you know, kind of threw the book at him as it were. And when his parents um, got him out on bond, he um, went for a hike in the woods and ended his life by suicide. Wow. So I guess you didn't expect this kind of a uh, uh, marriage in life. Eh? No, I mean, I, <laughs> like I said, I was just a small town girl, like no drama ever in my life. And I still look back at this and I was writing this book and I'm like, oh, did this really happen to me? Like it's so, it's so, especially looking at my life now and, you know, I'm happily remarried. Um, I just had my first baby in May. So I have a, uh, she'll be six months old on Thanksgiving. And so my, you know, my life is night and day to what it was, you know, back, um, actually September of 2022 was the 10 year anniversary of my divorce. Wow. So um, you say you're writing this book. So when you wrote this book and, and then it's finished, um, what is it that you hope readers take away from this book when they read it? The biggest thing is that it can happen to anyone. I have three college degrees. I'm highly educated. I have a very um, important government related job. Um, so for all intents and, pers- and purposes, I'm very smart. And it just does not matter how smart you are. It doesn't matter how much money you have, how little money you have. It can happen to anyone. These guys, they just know how to trick you and how to get you. And more than that, just know that you're not alone. And to reach out and talk to someone, you know, um, hindsight is twenty twenty. You know, I, I can look back and say, I wish I had done a couple things differently. I wish maybe I had left earlier. I wish maybe I had reached out and got more help um, from friends and family. But you don't know what you don't know, right? So I did the best I could. And so if people can learn from what I did right and what I did wrong, um, that that would just be perfect for me. And really, since writing this book, um, I get, um, DMs on my social media. Uh, it was daily. <laughs> it's trickled down to, you know, just a few a week at this point, but of other women telling me their story. Um, I've had, I've helped two women connect to resources and make plans, um, for getting out of their relationships. And it, it's just, it's an honor and a blessing to be able to, you know, kind of partake in that journey with these, with these other, um, men and women. Uh, who are in an intimate partner violence situation. Um, the other thing too is, you know, I kind of have two main takeaways or main pieces of advice that I would give to people who are in this situation. Um, the first one might sound counterintuitive, but I think it's probably the most important part. Um, and that is to get angry and stay angry as long as you can when you're in the thick of it, when you're trying to get out. Um, like I said, it takes up to seven attempts on average to leave. And I think, especially for me, as soon as I stopped being angry at him, I would forgive him, let him talk me into getting back together. And the last time I left, I just kept the fire in my belly. You know, I, I stayed really angry at him the whole time. And that just fueled me to do the next step to, to push even further. Like this was getting really hard, but you know what? forget him, screw him. I'm, you know, I'm going for it. And it was just super important. That said, on the flip side, um, eventually there, there does come a time when everything's said and done, papers are signed, custody arrangements are made, whatever. Um, you do have to be able to kind of let some of the anger go. Um, for me, I, I'm a firm believer that you forgive people, not not for them, like who cares about them, but it feels better for you to just kind of let it go and stop carrying it around. Um, so that's, that's one of the things that really worked for me is just to, you know, again, get really pissed off. And then the other piece of advice is it can be so overwhelming. You have no idea what to do, where to go, who to talk to. So 
I just, I just made like a list for myself and became like this very type A taskmaster and just kept checking off the boxes. Like you have to have a plan and know where you're going next. Um, Someone once said that leaving is a process and not an event. And that could not be more true. Like you don't just wake up one morning and you're like, okay, I'm out of here. You need to have a safe place to go. You need to know where your money's coming from. There's so much that goes into it. So even just reaching out to an organization, they can help you with those resources. Well, that's really important, you know. Um, so where to next? Like, are you um, going to keep working in this area and, and doing more books about this or more more talks about this? Or what do you think? Yeah, I have another idea in the back of my mind for another book um, that I would like to write about this. Um, uh, I just you know, just had a baby. So it's kind of on the back burner for right now. But you know, once I figure out like, keeping another like person alive, um, consistently, then um, I do want to start working on another book. Uh, on this, in the meantime, though, um, you know, I've, I've started um, booking places to speak and talk. Um, so I, I am a financial professional. Um, I worked a few years as a financial advisor. And so like a big passion project for me is that financial and economic abuse. So I'll be speaking early next year um, for a group in Maine called Together Invested. And it's a um, company that teaches women about investing and finances. Um, there's attorneys and financial advisors and stuff that, that do these seminars. And so I'll be speaking um, and talking about the importance of women specifically being involved in their finances in their household, whether you're in a DV situation or you're just in a normal relationship, um, you know, we should be part of those conversations. And I mean, my husband pays the bills, but I know what's going where and when. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm just going to start, you know, talking a little bit about bringing awareness to the fact that financial and economic abuse, again, I hate to be so num numbers driven, but just quick statistics on that. 98% of people who are in uh, an abusive relationship state money is one of the issues in the relationship. And of that 98%, 75% of people say they stay in the relationship because they can't afford to leave. And so when you're looking at numbers like one in three women have experienced domestic violence, 98% of one in three women in the entire United States has financial issues and 75% of that can't leave because of money. The numbers are just staggering at how many people really are affected by, you know, somebody other than themselves controlling all of their finances. So that's my, my soapbox. What do you think can, what do you think should be done? But like what could be done about this? So having worked in the financial field, I think that it's super important for professionals out there to be aware of this as well. Um, I used to talk to other financial advisors about the importance of, you know, if you're trying to book a financial planning session with someone talking about retirement income planning, things that affect both spouses. And one of the spouses says they don't need to be here. Their opinion doesn't matter like that. That should be a red flag for you to advocate on behalf of that other person. Now, if they tell you that they're not interested in it, there's only so much you can do, but really advocating that, you know, this is so important that your partner be involved in these decisions. Um, and as far as, you know, as the women are concerned, it's once you're in it, it's hard to change it. But, you know, I want to start talking to younger people before you get into this relationship. Um, that's really the best time, you know, while they're in high school, while they're in college, like let's have these conversations about, you know, your relationship with money and understanding it before you, before it's too late. It must've been hard getting into a new marriage after all of this. It, it was very difficult. I, um, like I said, it's been 10 years and I was single for the better half of five years after um, just never really could maintain a steady relationship. There was a lot of trauma, tr trauma triggers for me. Um, you know, I do have a PTSD diagnosis from my, uh, my mental health professional. And honestly, though, writing this book was very therapeutic. There is a form of therapy for, for people like myself who have trauma and they've disassociated with some of the memories. And for me, reintegrating what happened to me has given me the power to recognize when something sets me off. 
um, when I get random anxiety and I'm not sure why I'm getting it, I can kind of reflect back. I can't be touched when I sleep because, you know, he would, you know, wake up and, and, and kick me or, or hit me and punch me when he, when I was in bed and sleeping. So, you know, I, I don't like to be touched when sleeping. Um, you know, there's certain things when we're in the car, cause he was a very aggressive driver. So there's certain things that, you know, I'll just have like a, a panic attack or, or just a moment. And so, you know, my husband, you know, is very understanding and, you know, he was, he was with me through this whole process of writing this book. So, um, you know, he understands it and he gets it. And that was super important as well that, you know, he have a little bit of patience and grace. And sometimes my reactions are not about something that he's done. It's just, you know, it, it reminded me of something. And the way I explain it is if somebody comes up to you and they raise their hand above your head, you know how you just instinctively duck uh, someone somewhere along the line, probably your younger brother or sister or older brother and sister, you know, they smacked you upside the head when you were kids playing around. And so your body just knows instinctually that, oh, hand raised duck, protect yourself. And that's what my trauma tr- triggers are like. I don't make a conscious reaction. It, it's, it's like this cellular memory, like my body physically remembers what happened and my mind doesn't make a conscious choice to react. It just happens. And being able to recognize that um, through writing this book has, has been really restorative to me personally. How were your parents through all of this at the end? My dad is always such a level headed guy, very, you know, kind of laid back. Um, I get a lot of my personality from him. Um, So he was, he was pretty, upset but you know he he was he was okay um my mom on the other hand was really upset um because she really didn't know everything until you know reading the book I had told her bits and pieces um and I think just like any parent you know she blamed herself for some of it for not preparing me well enough um for not seeing more of the red flags for not jumping in and doing something about it so it was really hard for her um, to read some of this stuff. Um, and you know, she and I had to have some conversations about the fact that like this, I do not blame you for anything. Like nothing that happened is your fault. It's also not my fault. There's only one person to blame for this. That's Steven. Um, so yeah, it was really difficult for her specifically to read. I mean, and now being a new mom myself of a daughter, like, Ooh, I don't, I would just, yeah. I don't even know what I would do. So I can, I can totally relate with you know how she was feeling after reading it. You feel it's important to go get help in situations yeah. like this, uh, you know, with a, with a psychologist yeah. or somebody, a counselor uh, after you get out of something like this. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it, I finally reached out to someone when I was literally sitting on the floor crying, just ready to end it all. And remembered that my employer had passed out an employee assistance brochure and there was a like emergency line that you could call to speak with a mental health provider. And I did. And then they set me up with a counselor and I've basically been in counseling since then um, on and off. Um, I just think that if you had cancer, you would go see an oncologist. If you have trauma or you have anxiety, you just need a, a neutral third party to talk to go get that treated just like you would any other disease. Your, your brain is just as important in your mental health as the rest of you. Do you, do you put out social media or contact information and everything now for the public or do you? I do. So I actually have a Facebook page and I had no idea what I was doing with it. I'm, I'm not great at the socials like (laughs) the kids these days. Um, But I have a Facebook page. It's, uh, it's just my name, Sarah Doucette, author. And I, during this process, I would record while I would go and write. So, you know, because a lot of my friends and family kept saying, you should write this book. And when I was like, okay, I'm writing the book, they were just fascinated by the process because nobody knew anyone who had ever written a book before. So I kind of chronicled my journey of writing the book. And then I did a lot of Facebook Live videos that are all saved on there, just talking about, you know, what is gaslighting? What does it look like? Um, what is a narcissist, (laughs) you know, things like that. So it's got a bunch of educational content that I've created. Um, and 
and videos about me like writing the book and stuff. And so I still post on there. Um, now that the book has been published, it went quiet for a little while during COVID because kind of the world stopped, but I've been slowly picking it back up. And um, I do have some plans to really get it up going with more videos and more educational content and things like that. Well, fantastic. Well, actually, we will get everything posted, your book and everything up there so people can find yes. you with one click. Um, the book is called Stronger Than That, A Domestic Violence Survivor Uncovers the Truth About Her Abuser. So um, our guest has been the author of that, Sarah Doucette. Thank you for being here. Thank you guys so much for having me. It was great to meet you and talk to you. Thanks, Sarah. You've been listening to the House of Mystery radio show. To find out more about our guests, hosts, or shows, go to www.houseofmystery.com. Show's over for now. Was it as good for you as it was for me? Well, good night. This has been a production of Something Weird Media. I'll be back.